What's up guys, Darren here with Renaissance Coders, and I'm really excited to finally start this series. As you may already know, we are kicking off our one game a month challenge and then teaching you everything you need to know to make your own games. And it really couldn't have come at a better time too, when we're about to hit a million views on our Flappy Bird tutorial, which is just insane to think about. And I think it's just obvious that you guys would like to see more videos like this. So I wanted to talk a little bit just for a moment about sort of salaries and game development. You may be coming across this tutorial because you want to get into indie development or maybe you want to get a job in game development. And so I thought it might interest you to preface this video with a few statistics from Glassdoor. Um, you can see here the average pay for a developer in the US is 50 grand, uh, ranging anywhere from 52 to 80,000. I think that's a little bit on the low end based on my experience. It's really easy for game developers um, who really know their stuff to, to hit six figures. And uh, there's actually another article here that I'll post in the description that you can take a look at. Um, this has a little bit more um, statistics on companies in different states in the US. And you can see that a lot of these, these top companies are actually paying a lot more than that average. And you'll see that you'll even get well into the six figure range here. Uh, that might be in the, the higher value um, states when it comes to cost of living, like California or New York, but you can still see that it's very easy to get into that six figure range as a game developer. So this is definitely a good time to start learning these skills. And what I've learned with game development as well is when you, when you become really good at creating game development software, you become really good at software in general because game development requires, uh, it requires creativity and it requires technical um, expertise as well. And so those skills translate across software as a whole. So this is a really good industry to be getting into. Right, so let's talk about what we're actually going to be making here. And I do want to preface that um, all, for all of the games that we're going to be making this month, we're actually going to be putting these on the Android store and later on the iOS store. And uh, they'll be available for you guys to actually download and play before you can get into the tutorial. And you'll actually be able to you know, play the thing that you're going to create. And then, of course, if you guys want... Whatever you guys create from this tutorial, you can feel free to put up on the store as well. So uh, the, the first game that we're making is called Tap Shift, and let's just sort of go through it to see what, um, is it, what the game is all about. Okay, so essentially you're just this little ball and you're bouncing up through these different obstacles. The goal is to not get hit. So when you get hit, you actually lose, and then you get this game over screen that gives you an overview of um, your stats for that, that, that round. So you can see here, we have the score displaying here under the star, you have the personal best, you have the distance traveled, the uh, amount of currency that you may have collected, and then some XP. You have the ability to go back home or to actually restart that round. So let's just play through for a little bit and, uh, and see what else there is. So we actually have some some pickups in this as well. So here's a times four multiplier for your score. So now you can see every time we pass an obstacle, we get four points. Then we also have this one, which is pretty interesting, the rotate pickup that actually rotates your screen. And this gets definitely a little bit tricky to play. Uh, and then here we have an invincibility mode. So those are our three different pickups that you can actually collect. And you can see with invincibility mode, you can just click right through without dying, okay? So there we picked up another camera rotation. So that's the game, it's really simple. And it was actually inspired by a game called Color Switch, which you may have heard of. It has about 10 million downloads on the Google Play Store. And that one's definitely different, but it was inspired by that game, as well as another game called Duet, which I'll link both of these games in the description if you wanna check those out. Um, the the game that we're making is definitely different from both of those, but you can see some similarities in in those um, when it comes to this game. For instance, Color Switch, you have the same portrait view where you're clicking to uh, progress through the level. And then with 
with duet, it's sort of this cool black and white aesthetic uh, where you're also traversing through obstacles. To make this game, we're going to be using C Sharp and Unity 3D. And just to list a couple of the things you'll be learning throughout this series, we have asset creation, finding audio and sound effects for free for commercial use. Of course, C Sharp game programming specifically. You'll learn a lot about the Unity 3D editor. You'll learn about animation. You'll learn how to use different tweening scripts. You'll learn about physics triggers and camera manipulation, just to name a few things. The structure of this series will be like this. It'll be split into four parts. I'm not sure yet how long each of those parts are going to be. I think in total, they should be less than four hours for sure. So possibly 45 minutes to an hour per video. The first tutorial that we're gonna be going through today is going to cover sessions, game controller, player controller, and the camera controller. In the second video, we're gonna be looking at obstacles and the design of different obstacles. We're gonna be looking into pickups and creating some of the art for the pickups. In part three, we're gonna be covering player death, the game over screen, and score tracking. And to tie it all together in the fourth video, we're gonna be bringing together the splash screen with the main menu screen and adding some audio tracks to the background. And that should add a nice polish to our game at the end. And after you go through each of these four parts, you should have a pretty cool game developed that you can, of course, put on the, the Android store for yourself or on the iOS store. All right, so <clears throat> starting things off here, we'll just open up the Unity Hub and we are gonna be using, let's create a new project. We're gonna be using Unity 2020.1 Alpha. And uh, the current version that I'm on specifically is the Alpha 17. I think they're on 24 or, or maybe beyond that at this point, but uh, whichever Alpha version uh, whichever alpha version you're using uh, should be fine. In fact, using any version of Unity, you should be able to follow along. Uh, 2019 or 2018, even 2017, you should be able to follow along. There's nothing too crazy that we're doing here specific to 2020. Okay, we're going to be building a 2D project, so we'll select that. And then we'll just call this Tap Shift Demo. And uh, go ahead and choose a location that you want this to be in. I'm going to choose mine right now. And once you select your location, you can just click create. Unity is going to do some setup here for the 2D project, but it's all going to be very basic. And uh, I don't think there will be really anything in this project. So we're really starting from scratch here. Okay, so while this is loading here, let's go over to GitHub and uh, I'll put a link to this Git in the description. We are going to be using these tools. So do this right now, go over to GitHub, uh, go over to this link and clone or download. If you're, um, if you're comfortable with Git, you can go ahead and just clone it into your directory. You can feel free to fork uh, the directory and make any updates that you want in the future as well. If you're not familiar, you can just click download zip. That's going to give you all of these scripts here. And um, these scripts are of course subject to change over time, but we are going to be using these in this tutorial. So make sure you do this. Uh, just go to download zip and then we're gonna be pulling that code into our project. So I think Unity opened up. So let's go over and see what our project looks like so far. Okay, so they start us off with a scenes directory and a packages directory. There's nothing in the packages and we have a sample scene we're going to delete because we want to start with our own scene from scratch. Now my layout might look a little bit different than yours. Feel free to adjust some of your windows as needed. Just a high level overview for those of you who aren't too familiar. We have our project directory, which is going to hold our assets. Uh, 
We have the hierarchy, which is going to describe what we have in our scene. And then we have the scene view, which is where we can actually make modifications to our game scene. There's nothing in there right now. We'll stay in 2D mode for the rest of this tutorial. And then we have the game view, which is going to represent what our actual window is going to, to show for the game, what's actually going to be showing up on our mobile devices. Okay, so we downloaded that zip. Let's open up the zip contents and see what we need to bring into our project. Before we do that, let's create a new folder called scripts. We'll open that up. Now let's go see what we unzipped. Let's see. Okay, so in my downloads now I have Unity Core Master. I'm going to extract this. And then in here we have some code. I'm just going to grab all of these folders and drag them into our, actually before I do that, let me create one more folder in here called core. So in our scripts folder, we create another folder called core. And then, and then I'm going to drag all of these into there. Okay, and we might have some errors because these scripts are not totally dependent. It looks like we're looking for a game controller, which is no problem. All we have to do is create that game controller. Actually, what I might do instead is go to the session controller and make a couple updates real quick. So whenever we went over the session controller in that tutorial, um, yeah, by the way, it's worth mentioning that all of these scripts I just pulled in, there are tutorials for each one of those. In case you aren't familiar, those will be in the description as well. But we talked about in that tutorial uh, making some connections to the game. So I'm going to comment out some of these, these calls to the game. And then we're actually going to come back and go, go back over the session controller script since it uh, is relevant to this particular tutorial. There's also some references to the page controller. Uh, we won't worry about going over that just yet, but that should clear up some of the errors that we have in Unity. So let's go back to Unity and make sure everything is okay. So instead of commenting out that, I'll just comment out the entire function here. Okay, let's go back to Unity. And then page type doesn't have a reference to pause pop up. So we'll comment out this line as well. Okay, with that, we have our core scripts. Um, just to go over a high level overview, we have a nice audio controller to help us manage our audio tracks. We have a data controller to help us save and store any sort of game related data on the user's device. We have a nice menu management system that we will be taking uh, use of, taking advantage of in this entire series. And then we have a scene controller to help us switch scenes, which we will be using. A session controller, which is pretty much already done for us, but we may end up adding or modifying that. And then we have some tween scripts that are going to help us move objects smoothly and reliably. So we're, we're going to go over a lot of these tween scripts for this particular game. Um, and we'll, we'll either be talking about these in this tutorial or in part two of this series. Okay, so we're off to a good start. We have pulled in our core scripts. Now we need to make sure that we're actually in a Android environment. So we wanna go up to file and then go to build settings. Right now we're in the PC, Mac, and Linux standalone build settings. We want to make sure that we're an Android. And so if you've installed Unity, um, you would have been provided an option to download the Android tools. If you haven't done that, you want to make sure you go ahead and do that. If you haven't installed the Android tools, there should be a button here to allow you to download those. And then Unity will handle the rest for you. Now it's worth noting that whenever you go to publish, you're going to want to build an app bundle. And, uh, what else is different? There's there's a couple things that are different with the new Android requirements. Whenever you go to build, you'll need to change your scripting backend from mono to IL2 CPP. 
and then you will be able to uh, support ARM64, which is what you need to be able to support. And uh, so those are those are some settings that are a little bit different. I know a couple of years ago, Android was, was easier to deploy to, but now you need to enable IL2 CPP. And then you also need to be building the app bundle. So you wanna make sure that this checkbox is checked. But once we do that, let's go ahead and switch the platform. And that might take a few seconds, depending on what you already have in your project. Should be pretty quick for us because we only added a few scripts. After this finishes, we'll go ahead and get started with our first scene. In this tutorial, we're going to just focus on the game scene. We won't worry about switching from a splash screen to a menu screen and then playing the game. We're going to start off really simple because the main thing that we want to do in this tutorial is simply um, have the ability to see our player and then click to move the player along. And then we want to have the camera follow that player. So those are the main requirements for this. So let's start off by going to our scenes folder and creating a new scene. And then we'll call this scene game. Very simple. And before we forget, oops, I accidentally saved the scene that we were on. I'll go ahead and delete that. So before we forget, let's go to our build settings again and then add the open scenes. Uh, whenever we go to actually build the game, whenever we actually go to build the game, we're going to want to make sure that this scene is in our build so that that's actually what shows up on our device when we go to test. Okay, I'll make sure everything is saved here. So we have the game and we have a main camera in our game scene. Uh, what I'm going to do is just set the background color to black since that's going to be the background color of our game. Now, I would like to mention that while we're talking about how to make this game, I highly encourage you to come up with your own designs, come up with your own art. Don't just copy everything that I do. Come up with something that's original so that when you actually put it up on the store, it's different from what I have and you can actually gain traction that way. Instead of just cloning games, uh, come up with something that's a little bit unique to your own game. Same thing that uh, whenever we go into talking about different pickups and what those pickups do, try to think of different ways or different, uh, different properties that your pickups are going to have on your player. Uh, don't necessarily copy exactly what I'm going to be doing. But for me, I'm going to set the, the background to black. Okay, our size is five. Our projection is orthographic, which is fine. And we have an audio listener on here, so that's all fine. So the default settings look okay for our camera. Okay, so we need a player and we're going to start off simple here. Let's go to create 2D object, create sprite. And then let's see if we can find something default in here. So we have a knob object, so we don't need to worry about creating a circle or creating any art in this tutorial. Uh, so our player is going to be this circle, this knob. And uh, let's, let's position the circle to where it's sort of in the starting position relative to our camera. And that's going to be somewhere here, I would say, and, and the player probably needs to be a little bit bigger. I'll go ahead and name the player. I'll also tag the player with the default tag in here called player, because I think we'll end up needing that eventually when we start dealing with triggers and physics. Okay, so we can see the XY position of the camera is zero. So we wanna make the player relative to that. So relative to the camera, we want the X to be zero. And then we just wanna move the Y position down. We can say to negative four, that looks good. And then we just wanna increase the size of our player in general. So I think a value of two for our player looks okay. You can modify this if you want though. You can make it bigger or smaller. Okay, at this point, we are ready to start creating the player controller and the camera controller. So 
we're moving right along at a good pace here. In our scripts folder, I want to I want to organize this in a way to where core our core scripts are dependent from the rest of the game as much as possible. So with that being said, we want to have a separate folder for our game scripts. And what this has allows us uh, what this allows us to do is say, you know, when we go to create another game, we don't have to change anything in core or uh, we have minimal changes to make in core from game to game. And only our game scripts should be changing from game to game. So we're going to create a game script in here. We'll create one for game controller. We'll just create everything that we're going to use in this tutorial. So we'll have the game controller. We'll have the player controller, which is what we're about to create. And then we'll have the camera controller. Let's see if there's anything else that we'll need for this tutorial. I think that's it. We have the session, the game, the camera, and the player. So I think that's all we need to touch for part one. Okay, so let's open up the player controller. So let's just think about what the player needs to do. Remember the player is going to be this little white ball at the bottom of our screen that when you click or when you tap, the player moves up incrementally and when you stop tapping, the player falls down. So there'll be some gravity manipulation in the script. Okay, now let's go ahead and just start from a sort of blank slate and then add things as we need. Of course, I like to organize my code with regions. So we'll add a region for the Unity related functions. And then we'll also add one for public I don't know if we'll need public functions yet, but I'll add the, the region anyway. Eventually we will need public functions. We'll have some public functions for the game controller to utilize, but I'm not sure if we'll need those just yet since we're only focusing on the player itself and how that player moves. Okay, so for our public functions, of course, we'll have the, for now we'll have the public, or I'm sorry, the private start. So we'll do some initial, uh, some initialization and start, and then we'll have the update function, of course, to handle the player updates. Um, for public functions, we won't worry about yet, and for the private functions, we'll have we'll have some functions to control or to sort of separate the actual actions that the player is going to to be able to do. So, for instance, the player will definitely be able to jump. So we'll add a uh, jump function. The player is definitely going to fall. So we'll add the fall function. And then we'll want another function just to handle actually moving the player. So actually moving the actual transform of the player, we'll call this move. So all of these functions will be called an update and we'll handle each one of those actions respectively within its own function. So in update, we're going to say uh, we'll call it jump, then we'll call it fall, and then we'll call it move. And the order of these aren't necessarily too too important from what I've seen. Uh, you can order these however you want since they're all be call being called in the same frame. Okay, let's talk about a couple of the member variables that we're going to need in the player controller. We'll have a couple of public parameters that we can man manipulate from the inspector. The first one's going to be the actual smooth time of the player, so how fast the player moves towards its target position. We'll have a jump force, so how fast or how with how much force does the player jump. We'll have a float for the acceleration of gravity, so how fast the player starts to move towards uh, the bottom of the screen. So we'll have that as gravity acceleration. Then we'll have a maximum on that gravity. So it doesn't get too out of hand and the player doesn't start falling too fast. We'll have a, we'll have a max on um, essentially the maximum force downward on the player. So we'll call this max gravity. Okay, we'll have a vector three, which is private for our target position. So this is the position that we're trying to move the player towards at a rate of this smooth time. 
we'll have a private float for the downward velocity. So this is um, this is the velocity dictated by the gravity acceleration and max gravity. So we can call this downward acceleration. And then we'll have another, um, actually, I think this is all we need. I think this will be fine for now. We'll come back and add things as we need to. But I think for the minimum requirements of this player controller, I think these are the only member variables that we're going to need. So let's start off by by defining our move function because this is this is what actually moves the the player's transform towards the target position. And target position is just going to be be manipulated by jump and fall. Okay, so move is going to be pretty simple. It's going to be a one line function. All we're going to do is be moving the player's position. So we can say transform, which accesses the player's object uh, uh, transform, which has access to the position, rotation, and scale. So we can say transform.position is going to be equal to a lerp. It's going to be equal to vector3.lerp. And inside the lerp, we have the initial value. So the initial value that we're moving from, we can say that that's transform.position and that's okay. And then our target position, our target position is the, the local variable, the private variable for target position. And then our third parameter is how fast we wanna be moving towards that position. With LERP, it's, it's technically a, a linear interp interpolation, but what we're doing here is not linear. However, we can still use the LERP function with these parameters to add a smoothing effect. So typically with this third parameter, you would want a value from zero to one, where zero, which sets you equal to your first parameter, and one would set you equal to your second parameter. However, because our, our initial value is always equal to our current position, we want a much higher uh, value for our smooth time. So the smooth time can be any value we want. It doesn't have to be a value from uh, zero to one necessarily. So our third parameter you can think of as a speed. So how fast do we wanna to move towards our target position? And what we can put here is our smooth public parameter times time dot delta time. And that's going to make this operation frame independent, meaning the speed of the player should not be dependent on our frame rate. Okay, uh, so that's all we need for move. Now in, in the jump and fall functions, we're going to be manipulating the target position. So let's start off with jump. So with jump, we want to check whenever the player taps or clicks. So we can use if input dot get mouse button up and this being a value of zero or one where zero is your left click and one would be your right click. So when we, when we get this operation, when we get this input, get mouse button up, this will give us clicks on our PC and it'll give us taps on our phone. So this works pretty nicely for testing. So whenever the player taps or whenever the player's mouse button is up or whenever the, the player releases their finger on their mobile device, we want to manipulate the target position. And so the target position is going to, to be modified on the Y axis because we're working on the X, Y axis. We're moving on the X, Y axis um, or the X, Y plane in this game. So we wanna modify in the up direction. So we can say the target position dot Y is simply equal to the current position, transform dot position dot Y plus the jump force. And this is a very basic way to handle this type of logic. We don't need to worry about using any sort of physics. It's not necessary for this uh, level of, I guess, detail. Um, this game is very simple, so we don't need to be worrying about things uh, like that or overcomplicating this operation. We can simply add to the current position um, using this jump force, uh, this jump force parameter. Okay, and whenever we do this, we want to reset the downward velocity. So we're essentially zeroing out the uh, the gravity on our player. So we can say the downward acceleration is now equal to zero which would imply that our fall operation is going to be manipulating this downward acceleration. So uh, let's see what we need to do there. Okay, so the first thing we do in our fall method is modify the downward acceleration. Uh, 
we can say the downward acceleration is going to be added by the gravity acceleration. Okay, and maybe a better name for this would just be the uh, downward velocity, since this isn't technically going to be an acceleration variable. Uh, the acceleration should modify the velocity. So let's rename this to downward velocity. That might that might make a little bit more sense. Okay. So our downward velocity is going to be modified by uh, modified by the acceleration, and then we can say that we want to clamp that by the current downward velocity and the maximum gravity. So we can say the downward velocity is equal to a clamp of the current value, and um, I'm sorry of so the first parameter is the value that we want to clamp. The second parameter is the minimum. Of course, the minimum should be zero, and the maximum would be our max gravity, our max gravity uh, public parameter. Okay. So here we're adding to the velocity using gravity acceleration, and then we're clamping the velocity to our our maximum gravity. So hopefully that makes sense. The next thing we want to do is, of course, modify the target position. Uh, on the y axis. So we can say the target position dot y, the target position dot y is going to be subtracted. So we're going to, to subtract the velocity um, from the y position so that the player moves in the downward direction. So we'll say the target position dot y minus equals the actual velocity. So the velocity times time dot delta time so that we can make that uh, independent of frame rate. Okay, after we do that, we just want to make sure that the player's position is never less than zero. Uh, if the player's position is less than zero, then we want to actually not necessarily zero. Let's go back to Unity and see what our minimum uh, player position would be. Okay, so what we're trying to do with this last part of the script is make sure that our player never falls below this point. So uh, let's see here. So the player's current position is negative four. So we just want to say that if the player's position is less than negative four, then we set the player position to negative four. This means that whenever we start the game and we start clicking, um, the player won't die if they fall back down to this initial position. Okay. However, if the camera moves upward and then the player falls down off the screen and the position is greater than negative four, then the player would lose because the player's already made some progress at that point. But whenever the player doesn't make any progress, we don't want to penalize or make the, the player lose just because they fall back to their initial position. So let's go back to the script and make sure that we're clamping uh, the minimum to negative four. Okay, so what this is going to look like is we'll say the target, uh, we'll use a condition. If the target position dot y is less than negative four, then we just set the target position to negative four. Okay, and that's pretty much all we need for the player controller. Let's go back to Unity and see if this works. So we'll click on the player here and we'll add the player controller. Of course, we're going to have quite a bit of adjustment to do with each one of these variables. I'm not exactly sure which values we want for these. We'll start off small so the, the player doesn't fly off the screen. We'll set the smooth to something like eight, the acceleration maybe 0.1 and the max gravity one. Let's see what we get with those values. I'm sure we'll have to spend a little bit of time modifying this though. Okay, let's turn off the maximize on play so we can get a scene level view of what's going on. So if I click, nothing is happening. Maybe the jump force needs to be a bit higher. Let's say 50. Or 200. Okay, so it looks like the player isn't moving. Uh, one thing that we could do is add some logging to make sure that uh, what's actually, make sure that we're actually introducing the logic that we wrote for those functions. So let's go back. Let's go back to uh, the script and make sure that we have everything written correctly. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll add a log statement right here, just outputting the player's position. So I'll just log the position. I wanna make sure that 
you know, something is actually changing on the y-axis at least. Let's go back to Unity and see if we're getting anything from this value. Okay, and just to exaggerate this, I'll make the jump force, you know, 500 or something like that. Okay, so the player's position is definitely changing here. Okay. Um, so now it looks like, you know, with the jump force that high, we're, we're definitely modifying the player position. So let's just reduce that back down to like five. Uh, for Maybe for whatever reason, my input wasn't being logged. There we go. Uh, for whatever reason, the first time I was running that, my, my input wasn't being registered for my click. But everything looks okay now. Uh, of course, the values need to be tweaked a little bit. So let's increase... There's a couple things we can do. So the, the gravity acceleration dictates how fast the player moves towards the maximum. So that value might be okay. We might just want to increase the max gravity. So if I increase that to 10, you can see we sort of, we do, we do approach the maximum pretty quickly and the maximum brings us down a lot faster. Let's, let's see if we increase that max gravity further. Okay, so not a lot of difference there. We'll bring that back down to 10, or we can see what five looks like. Okay, so I do like, I do like watching the, the player move down that fast. I think that's a pretty good value, but we need to maybe adjust our, our force on our jump. Let's bring that back down to two. Okay, so that actually feels pretty good. I'm pretty pleased with that. And one thing you want to do uh, is is make sure you just you know tap for a minute or so to make sure that the player is moving reliably at all times. Uh, you don't want it to be where you're you click you know ten or twenty times, and sometimes the player like flies off the screen, but other times the player doesn't move up that much. That would indicate you have some other underlying issue with how you're processing the player's position. Um, but this feels pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I'm pretty happy that we found those values that fast. So if you want to copy my values, I have the smooth at eight, the jump force at two, the gravity acceleration at one, and the max gravity at 10. And since we're in play mode, I wanna make sure that I copy the component because when we exit play mode, those values will change. So outside of play mode, I can right click on the component and paste those values back. So I'll run the game again to make sure that everything still feels good. And I'm pretty happy with how that feels. Okay, so um, there's something that I noticed here when I start the game. My player starts off towards the middle of the screen. That's because our target position is initialized to the vector of uh, zero, zero, zero. So because our player is currently at a value of negative uh, four, we wanna make sure that we initialize the target position where we want the player to start. So let's go back to the script and do that. So all that means is from our start function, we want to say that the target position is equal to our current position just like that. Let's go back to Unity and make sure that the player starts off at negative four. Okay, so everything looks good there. And as you can see, uh, because, because the player reaches uh, negative four, we never go below that value, okay? And you also wanna make sure that whenever we approach this negative four position, you wait a little bit and then click again and everything still feels good. So you don't want it to be a situation where when you click for the first time, the player doesn't jump as high. That would indicate that maybe you're not resetting your gravity properly, but this feels good. This, this, thing, this is a good start, I think. We might end up changing some of the values as we move forward. Okay, so of course now we have an issue to where the player can just jump off screen and the camera isn't following the player. So that's gonna be an issue. So let's go ahead and get started on our camera controller. Okay, so the type of behavior that we would want on our camera is um, whenever the player reaches a certain difference with the, the, the camera's position. For instance, if our camera is at zero, 
and our player is within two points of the camera, then we start following the player. Um, and that value can be modified. So we can say if the player is, a, is within one point of the, the camera or if the player is one point past the camera, then we start following the player's position. So that's kind of the behavior that we want. I think what we'll do is when the player reaches, um, w right whenever the player starts going above the camera's position, then the camera starts following the player. So that's the kind of behavior that we're going to try to strive for here. So of course, I'll start off by clearing out some of this boilerplate that Unity adds for us. And then I'll add some of our own boilerplate, which is going to be the region. So I'll add a region for Unity functions, and then a region for public, and a region for private. Okay, from here, of course, we want to start adding some of our public and private member variables. And because this is a camera controller, I want to make sure that we're requiring that whatever object this is placed on has a camera. So I'll add the require component attribute. And we want a component that is of type camera. And that's going to promise us that we'll always have a reference to a camera. So we can start off by creating a reference, private reference to our camera like this. And then in our awake or start function, we can initialize that reference. So we can say the camera is going to be equal to get component camera. And we know that this is always going to return a value that we care about because we're requiring the component of type camera. So this should never be null. Okay, let's go back to some of our public and private member variables. Let's see what we're going to need here. We'll need a reference to the player's transform. So we'll have public transform player. We'll have a smoothing value. So how fast do we want to move towards the player? Okay, and then we'll have some private member variables down here. We'll have the target position. So we'll have a reference to the position that we want the camera to move towards. Then we'll have the um, initial position, so where we want the player, where we want the camera to start, essentially. So we can have that uh, initial position. Okay, eventually we'll have some controls in here to um, handle that pickup that rotates the camera. So we'll end up having controls in here to change the camera size and rotation, but we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to focus on being able to follow the player um, in a in an upward fashion. Okay, with that being said, these are all of the member variables that we're going to need for now. Okay, so in our Unity functions, we'll have an update. So we'll say private void update, and then we'll have a function called follow player in here. So I'll go ahead and add that in the update function. And in private, we'll add the follow player function. Okay, before we actually do anything in this function, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping. And so we wanna make sure that the player reference actually exists. So we can say, you know, if the player is null, then we wanna log a warning because uh, if the player, if the transform is null, then we're just gonna keep throwing errors in this update function, which is not the behavior that we want. So we'll log a warning and we'll just say, camera could not find a reference to the player and then we'll return. So we don't want to do anything with the player object if it doesn't exist. Okay, from here, we just want to see, you know, we want to get that value, that difference value before we start following the player. So we want to determine how far away the player needs to be from the camera before the camera starts moving. So as I said, I want to wait until the player moves past the camera's position. So one thing that we can do to enforce that rule is say if the player.transform.position is greater than the camera's position, so greater than this position, the transform dot position dot y. So if the player is ahead of the camera, then we start uh, modifying the target position. So we can say the target position at that point, target position dot y is equal to the player's position dot y. So this is a very simple way to do this. All we're doing is saying um, all, we're, all we're doing to dictate the follow functionality is setting our target position to our player's position. So pretty simple there. Um, from here, all we need to do is 
use a vector three lerp similar to how we did in the player controller to actually move towards the player's position. So we can say transform dot position is equal to vector three dot lerp, where the first parameter is our initial parameter or our current position. So we can say the transform from the transform position towards our target position at a rate of smooth times time dot delta time. And with that, I think we should be able to go back to Unity and everything should be working pretty smoothly. Okay, we do have an error here, probably just a typo on my part. Um, the operator can't be applied to vector three and float. Let's check that out. So um, I need to be accessing the Y axis on the player's position, not just the player's position in general. Obviously that wouldn't be a fair comparison. Let's go back to Unity and make sure that cleared things up. Okay, everything looks good. Uh, I still have some logs in the player function, so or in the player script. So I want to go back to that and remove those logs because they're just cluttering up my console. So I'll come over here and just get rid of this debug log statement. There we go. And then back to Unity we go. All right, so on the, uh, on the main camera, we want to add the camera controller. And then of course we want to add the player and a smooth time. Let's just say a smooth time of five and see how that feels. Okay, and we should, let's see, from our scene view, as I start moving, we should be able to watch this camera move up uh, to follow our player's position. Perfect. And for some reason, I can't see my player. That's kind of weird. Ah, uh, okay. Um, well, that's kind of interesting. My, my Z position on my camera is going kind of crazy. Never seen that before. It's still at zero. It's just kind of moving around. Uh, my player is not in view. So I will say that if you're using the alpha version of Unity, you'll see some weird stuff like this happen occasionally. But just to be safe, let me turn off. Let me remove the camera controller. If I remove the camera controller and I can still see the player, which I can, then there's something with my player controller that's causing issues. My, there's something wrong with my camera controller that's causing issues which is kind of strange. We'll see if we can figure this out without wasting too much time. Right, so I think I see the issue here. Uh, our Z position is being set to uh, zero. That's because I forgot to set my initial position parameter. Let's go back to the script and see what we need to fix uh, to fix this little bug. Uh, but before we do that, you can see sort of how I found that out. The, the camera's position starts off at negative 10. If we move that towards zero, then we get to the point where we stop seeing the actual player object. If I go back into 3D mode here, it actually makes sense because as we watch the camera move towards the player, it disappears. You can see at the point where it disappears is whenever it goes outside of the camera's viewing angle. Okay, so that makes perfect sense why that was happening. I'll move that back to negative 10. Let's go back to the camera controller to see what we need to fix. Okay, so from the start function, let's first make sure that we're we're initializing our target position equal to the tran, uh, transform position. Same thing that we had to do in the player controller. And then also, let's go ahead and make sure that we set our initial position. We'll end up needing this whenever we, re whenever we reset the camera during uh, a game reset or game over. So we'll go ahead and initialize, set the initial position to the target position. Okay, with that, we should be good. We can go back to Unity and we should be able to see the player. Okay, and just as an overview, we have the camera controller on the camera and the smoothing set to five. Now we should be able to run this and watch the camera actually follow the player. So you can't really tell in the game view, but you can tell in the scene view. Now, the interesting thing to note about this is when the player falls off of the screen, 
um, the camera doesn't necessarily follow. We don't really want the camera to follow in that case. We would say that when the, the player falls off of the screen, then we end the game. However, the only time that we move the camera is whenever the player actually moves beyond the camera's position. So we'll run that again to dem demonstrate that. Okay. So you can see the camera follows, but if we fall below the camera's viewing angle and the player's position isn't negative uh, four, then we actually want to end the game. So if we were to fall like down to here, the player would be killed and we would show the game over screen. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna do in this tutorial is sort of tie everything together in a cohesive manner. That is to say that we want the session to be in control of our game loop and we wanna have a game controller that has control over all of the update loops related to our game. So what that means is we're going to have this overarching session controller that manages everything about the app. The session will have a um, the session will have a reference to the game controller and will always be in control of updating or not updating the game. The game controller will have a reference to anything game related and how those things update. So let's go to our scripts and make some modifications so that hopefully this makes a little bit more more sense. So I want to open up my core session controller here. Now you can see that in the beginning of the video, we did comment some of the game controller related logic out. I wanna uncomment that stuff. So our session controller will have a reference to our game. And let's see, we have the update function. So the game will always be in control or the session will always be in control of how the game updates. And we have that control through this paused variable, which we may end up using later in this series. The session is going to have a public function for the, the game to access to initialize the actual game. And when that happens, we'll initialize the game and have a reference to our game to use in our update function. So one thing that I want to make sure that I do, in addition to checking for whether the game is paused or not, is to make sure that I have a valid reference to my game before trying to update it. So I'll say, if the game is null, then I also want to return here. So make sure that you add that line in before making any of these modifications. Okay, so with this, that would imply that our game controller needs to call initialize game at some point. It also needs a function called on update and on init. So let's go to our game controller. And we're getting rid of some of the boilerplate here. Okay, so one thing, first of all, is that we're going to have a reference to unitycore.session. That's going to provide us the ability to have a reference to our session, our session controller. So we can create that private reference. And then a good practice to do with any sort of controller is to get that controller with integrity. So what I usually do um, is I'll say, throughout this script, if I want to reference the session, then I'll access it through a property, a local property. So I want to get the session with some amount of integrity like this. So I'll say private session controller session. And what this will do is I'll have a getter in here and I'll say if the session is null, so if session is null, then I'll say debug.log warning and then in that warning, I'll tell the developer that the game is trying to access the session, but no instance of session controller was found. And this is just, this is sort of, um, I don't wanna say boilerplate, but this is, this is pretty common whenever you're trying to access a controller. You wanna make sure that uh, when, every time you access that controller, uh, if the session doesn't exist, you want to log the warning and return. Uh, re we'll return null. Or actually, we don't need to return anything here. Um, the the property is always going to return the session, null or not. It's the caller's responsibility to determine what to do if the session is null. And I'll show an example of that in just a moment. The first thing that we do actually is if the session is null, 
then we set the session. So we say the session at this point would be equal to session controller dot instance. And if we go back to our session controller, you can see that we have this static accessor for the instance. Okay, so let's go over this really quick. If the session doesn't exist, we initialize the session. If after we initialize the session, the session still does not exist, then we wanna log this warning. Regardless, we're gonna return the session. Okay, so we'll see how to properly use this property throughout our game controller in just a second. Okay, I wanna add some boilerplate here. We'll have the Unity functions, the public functions, and the private functions. So we'll have public and private down here. Okay, so for our, our Unity functions here, we're gonna have the, um, we'll have private, uh, let's see. Let's just do awake or let's do start. So we wanna do this in start. Then we'll say, if not session, then return. Okay, so what this does is it calls all of this code in the getter for us because we're accessing the session. So if not session return, if we get beyond this statement, this condition, then we know that we have a valid session. And if not, then we, we log that warning for the developer to see. So here I would say session dot initialize, initialize game with this. Okay, so remember the session controller is going to call game on init and game on update. So in our public functions, we want to, uh, we want to create those, those definitions. So we'll have public void on init and public void on update. So notice that we're not doing anything in the update function on the game controller. So in other words, we're not calling update like this. The reason why is because we want all of that localized. We want all of the update localized to the session. We also want all of the initialization localized to the session. So in essence, the session has full control over everything about the game. So in on init, we initialize all of our game systems. And in on update, we update all of our game systems. Okay. So what this means is our game controller is going to have a reference, public reference to our player controller and our camera controller. Okay. And what we'll end up doing is saying player dot on init, camera dot on init, and same thing for updates. So a couple of benefits here. One benefit is you get a nice high level overview of everything about your game from, initial, from initialization to updating. The second benefit is you have control over the order. You have direct control over the, the order of how things are initialized and how things are updated, which can be very valuable at times. Okay. So what this implies, of course, is we need to make some, some modifications to our player and our camera controller. So let's go to our player controller and instead of this private void update and this private void start, we're going to uh, move these over to our public functions and call this on init and on update. Just like that. Okay, and we can probably get rid of this region. We might end up requiring to to do some things in some other um, Unity event functions later. If we need to, then we'll add that region back. Okay, and in our camera controller, we'll do something very similar. Of course, we'll take everything and start and update and move those into an on init and on update function. Okay, so that looks like about all we need. We do wanna make sure that while we're testing here, the paused variable is going to be false, which I think it should be. So let's just go back to Unity and hook some of the stuff up and see if it works.
Okay, so we do have some errors here. Um, I may have forgotten to make these public. So we'll go back to our player and our camera, make sure that those update and initialize functions are public. And then let's go back to Unity to make sure we fix that. Okay, so everything looks good there. We're going to have an empty object for our our core systems. Okay, so our core systems are our, our persistent systems. That'll include our sessions, our audio management, our, our menu management, and other things like that. So we'll have on our core system object, the session controller. And on we'll have another empty object called game systems. And on our game systems, we'll have game related systems, of course, the first one of which will be the game controller. So the game controller will need so far a reference to the player and the camera. And with that, we should, we should be able to play the game and everything should work exactly the same. Okay, so everything is, is exactly the same but we have the benefits of the things that I just talked about. Okay. And so with that, I'm going to close out this tutorial. We are at a very good point where we have the, the session and the game relationship tied up nicely. Uh, we have player movement and camera movement. And in the next tutorial, we're going to be covering the, the creation of obstacles and the spawning of those obstacles, the design of various different types of obstacles. And then we'll also start introducing pickups and the scripts required to implement those different pickups. So thanks for watching part one of this series. We have three more parts before we finish the game. And then of course, we're gonna be continuing this throughout the year with 10 other games. So thanks so much guys for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, turn on notifications and refer this to a friend who's trying to get into game development. So thanks guys and I'll see you in the next tutorial.